So welcome everyone to Bath Iron Works. We're here today with uh, the Maine Natural Guard, Veterans for Peace, and the uh, Global Network Against Weapons and Nuclear Power in Space. I'm sure we have some others represented here as well. The conversion campaign calling attention to the fact that it would create 50% additional good union jobs if we would build something else than warships right here at the Bath Iron Works plant. Um, we've been talking about conversion for years. It's been exciting to me. I'm Lisa Savage, uh, founder of Maine Natural Guard. And um, I was excited at the beginning of the pandemic to see Bath Iron Works, in fact, do a conversion where they turned on a dime and started building machines that produced COVID swabs for COVID testing right at the beginning of the pandemic. And they did it with the, natu the National Defense Authorization Act and federal funds. Senator Angus King was involved in, in uh, you know, finding the, the deal to do that. It showed that it can be done. They did it quickly. They built, I think, 28 of the machines and delivered them uh, quickly to the company that was using that particular test. So when they tell you conversion can't be done, it can be. Uh, there, where, where there's a will, there's a way. I'll be speaking a little bit later about how manufactured consent gets manufactured. Why is it that the people of the U.S. who don't support wars and don't support spending more than half the discretionary budget every year on uh, the Pentagon budget, how is it that they still end up with these programs uh, where the only uh, good union job in town is building for the war machine? How does that happen? It's a, it's a planned program and they've got lots of ways to make it work. So I'll be talking about that a little bit when it's my turn uh, to speak. We have some great speakers today. We're gonna hear from Bruce Gagnon first. Uh, Bruce is a coordinator of the Global Network Against Weapons and Nuclear Power in Space. He lives right here in Bath. He's down here uh, bi-weekly doing a vigil with other Veterans for Peace members um, uh, to talk with the Navy personnel that come here and talk with the, the workers themselves. We are not against the workers. Bruce has reached out many, many times, walked the picket line with them, and um, understanding that really all our interests are in common. Um, so uh, welcome Bruce Gagnon, and let's hear what he has to say for us today as part of Keep Space for Peace Week. Hello, everyone. Thank you for being here today on very short notice. We, uh, we were invited uh, a month or two ago by the chief of police in Bath to come to his office to have a meeting. And he told us that uh, whenever there was going to be a christening in the future, they would let us know. And uh, as it turned out, they didn't which was very disappointing. <clears throat> we thought the chief was an honorable man, but turned out that his word wasn't uh, his bond. But anyway, we're glad to be here no matter what, and we're grateful that you all came. Today is the beginning of Keep Space for Peace Week, where people and groups around the world are organizing various events, to help people understand how space technology today coordinates and directs all warfare on the planet Earth. Just to give one illustration, in 2008, a Aegis destroyer built here at Bath Ironworks fired an interceptor missile into space into lower Earth orbit and knocked out an old U.S. military satellite, showing the capability of performing as an anti-satellite weapon. They called it Operation Burnt Frost. You can go online and search for that and find many, many different articles. They were very braggadocious about it. So, you know, we're told that these warships are built to defend us, to defend America. But in fact, the technology on these warships is not about defense whatsoever. It's about offense. And they don't stand just off the shores of America protecting us you know, from the bad guys. 
they go overseas just off the shores of Russia and China in a very provocative effort to show who's in control of the world's oceans. Very provocative, destabilizing, and right now threatening, threatening over and over again, World War III. Something that would be calamitous. It would be a nuclear war, and this would be right here. Ground zero for a nuclear shot by some other nation. We'd be, eva we'd be evaporated within seconds. But this is what our government does. And they tell us that there's no money to deal with health care, with growing poverty, with climate change. There's really no money to deal with these serious problems that we have today. Because we've got to, if I could use the word piss, piss away our nation's wealth down a rat hole. For many years, one of our friends that worked at Bath Iron Works, Peter Woodruff, would be with us on a day like today, taking pictures. That sign that Mary Beth is holding right there, are we building a sustainable future yet? Peter made that sign so that we would hold it. And when he put the word we in there, he was talking to his fellow workers at Bath Ironworks. Peter worked 34 years at BIW. And one day he got this bright idea that I want to start a petition, he said, saying that we want to build offshore wind turbines at BIW. Do you think I'll get fired? And so he and a few friends collected over 800 signatures of workers at the shipyard. And you know, it's not easy because the shipyard is spread out between two towns, three or four different sites. So it's not easy to get to everybody. And then afterwards, after they got the signatures, he wondered, what do I do next? What do I do with these? And so I suggested that maybe he talk to the editor at that time, Jim McCarthy, at the Times Record. And he did. And Jim McCarthy wrote an editorial congratulating Peter Woodruff for his vision and his courage. And then Peter went and made some bumper stickers that said, save BIW, build wind turbines. And he handed it out to fellow workers who put them put the bumper stickers on their lunch pails and on their trucks. And it wasn't very long after. This was when Baldacci was governor. Baldacci decided to send a team, a research investigation team, to the Nordic countries to look at their offshore wind uh, program. And Bath Ironworks sent a representative along on that journey. And I believe that their BIW's decision to send someone on that trip had much to do with Peter's effort to express to the company that a sizable proportion of workers wanted to begin a process of conversion because they understood what climate change was all about. And fighting more war ain't going to help us with climate change. Well, you know, Peter and I had a radio show at Bowdoin College for six years where we would play music and talk politics, had the union president from S6 come and talk about conversion. We did all kinds of things. But then he began to lose his voice. And so we had to quit the show. He couldn't really talk anymore. And what he learned was that all the years of breathing in metal dust began to get into his brain and turned off switches inside of his brain where he could no longer speak. He discovered this 
because he went online and found out that in South Africa, where they mine magnesium, ma manganese, thank you, manganese, the workers that mined it were coming down with very identical problems. And so he went to the company doctor. He went to the doctor and he asked, you know, for tests. Could he have tests? And the doctor said, are you trying to hurt the company? And Peter said, no, I just want to find out what's wrong with me. Well, a few weeks later, on a Sunday, if you can imagine, a Sunday, Peter got a phone call from his doctor's secretary saying that the doctor no longer wants to have you as a patient. I've never heard of a doctor firing a patient before. But the doctor at the BIW HMO, the, the company HMO, fired him. So then he went to a labor lawyer in Portland and he said, can I file a class action suit against the company for this poisoning that's affecting us workers. And they said, well, no, but we can get a settlement for you, a cash settlement. And he said, I'm not interested in that. And so he rejected that. And he just kept doing his work, kept trying to educate people about the need to convert this place here where we are today. I think we all should hold Peter in our hearts very closely and remember what a courageous, dear fr friend he was to us all. Every uh, two Wednesdays, the second and fourth Wednesday of every month, Peter Morgan over there on the left side of that big banner painted by our friend Russell Ray who's right here. The second and fourth Wednesday every month, Peter Morgan and John Morris and myself and occasionally a few other people have been going to the Navy compound gate just up the street a little bit where the black fence is and holding banners like this during the lunch hour, having some interesting conversations with sailors and shipyard workers handing out literature. And so we invite people to come and join us anytime in the coming weeks. We'll be there next Wednesday. That's the, I believe the, is it the second Wednesday? No? The Wednesday following? Okay. The Wednesday following, yeah. Uh, at 11 o'clock. So the second and fourth Wednesday at 11 o'clock. And then also on October 9th, the last day of Keep Space for Peace Week. We're holding another vigil here. It'll be up at the normal place at the administration headquarters building at 1130. So we invite you to join us then. So thanks a lot for being here today. Thanks for helping, again, bring this message, this very important message to the community. Thank you, Bruce. Let's hear it for Bruce Gagnon. Um, I've heard that the uh, VIPs are entering at the North Gate today. And so those people that are risking arrest will be down at the North Gate. Um, if you've joined us at the South Gate and you realize, no, I'd rather, I need to be at the North Gate, um, now might be a good time to move. I see lots of people have arrived while Bruce was speaking. It's really good to see you all here. Thanks for coming. I'm Lisa Savage of the uh, Maine Natural Guard. Maine Natural Guard is a group that you can easily join. There are no dues, uh, but what you do is sign a pledge to say, when people talk about security, bring up that climate crisis is the biggest security threat to everyone on the planet right now. And then when people bring up climate crisis, point out that the Pentagon is the biggest institutional burner of fossil fuels on the planet and is literally 
driving climate crisis. So if you're talking about solving climate crisis without talking about the military's gigantic greenhouse gas boot print, you are not really talking about the problem. So I, I invite you to find us online, Maine Natural Guard, take the pledge. And if you'd like to buy a t-shirt, you can do that too. Um, we're gonna be hearing from uh, a speaker that's also been here at Bath Ironworks many, many times and a leader in our local peace community. Uh, Rosie uh, Paul lives in Brunswick where she has been helping do a weekly vigil since 9-11 more or less about questioning whether a war, an, a global war on terror was the right response to the unfortunate events of 9-11 and whether we couldn't find a better way forward for our efforts and our money and to address the climate crisis. So welcome, Rosie, come on up. Well, there are so many things that one could choose to say today. And then having chosen one, there are so many tones of voice to use to say it. And I like to be a peacemaker, but I do get angry. And I wanna say a few things in a little bit of an angry tone of voice that I hope will make you sit on the edge of your chair and pay attention and get up off of there and talk. Anyway, can you believe that we are here for the christening of another destroyer aptly named? When destroying isn't really what the planet needs at this point. Can you believe that the War Department is subsidizing, well, our federal tax dollars are subsidizing the building of this ship. Is that what we value? Is that the way we want our tax dollars to be spent? Can you believe that the pollution this ship will create and add to the Pentagon boot print is exempt? by law from being included in the United States carbon emissions? Can you believe? Do you ask why? Is it to promote democracy around the world and or even at home? Is it to protect our people from hunger and homelessness or our lands from drilling and fracking? or to protect the very space over our atmosphere from the pollution of war. What we're protecting with our wars is our economic power. And we're supporting, by saying not much about it, we're supporting the very, very rich who are addicted to profit and war and dominance over other people, other countries. And I don't see a way of finding that to be okay. You'll say, well, there's a lot of good stuff going on. And yes, there is a lot of good stuff going on. Wonderful small shifts toward building another kind of culture that doesn't value greed and dominance, that in fact sets those people who are greedy and dominant aside and says, no, they're the ones that need to be kept separate from us because we really believe that we're all here to nurture each other and the planet. And it's all about love, really, bottom line. The Beatles knew it. We all know it. So. If we're going to build these small shifts toward making our culture one that nurtures and is compassionate and gentle and has a good time at it, we must also take a step out of line and speak or sing or pray publicly today every day. I would also add, perhaps, that the PeaceWorks group that was started at the time of 9-11 had its 20th anniversary this year, as did the unfortunate events of 
um, tragic events of 9-11. However you look at it, it's tragic. Um, and we submitted a very nice celebratory article to our local paper, the Times Record, and they refused to print it. Or, more kindly said, they chose not to print it, didn't give a reason. When asked when it would be in, they simply said, there is no plan to publish this. So how can we find out about the small shifts? How can we find out about the big plunking boot prints and what's really happening with them if the newspapers are choosing what to print? So I say, wake up, step out of line, speak up. Thank you very much. Thanks, Rosie. Yes, we're very lucky to have our own media here today. Uh, Martha Spees is here with Peace Action Maine, and uh, we'll be putting a video of our uh, program today up on the YouTube channel for Peace Action Maine, as long as there is a YouTube channel for Peace Action Maine. Um, we have to fight censorship constantly in the corporate press and now on the social media platforms of Silicon Valley. Uh, who are also corporations, but we will uh, keep trying and we will keep working at it to be our own uh, media. I also want to give a shout out today to the Artist Rapid Response Team of the uh, Union of Maine Visual Artists. Many of the beautiful painted banners that you see us holding here were created by art. And uh, we have Natasha Mayers here with us. She has been leading art and responding to uh, all kinds of groups trying to make the world a better place. The, and the artists get together once a month and they paint banners in response to community groups that have asked for their help with that. I know that um, many, many times in my blog I've used pictures of the beautiful art banners. So um, thank you for helping us get the word out that way. When you have the artists on your side, really, you know you're going to win in the end. Our next speaker is someone who's also been uh, doing a lot of the heavy lifting work here at BIW over the years. Ted Hendrick is a member of Veterans for Peace. He was a mover and shaker at the very beginning of the conversion campaign. Uh, and he has traveled far to be with us today. One of the things that Dud does is travels to other countries in the world to see what kind of effect U.S. militarism has on the people who live there. And I really respect that work that many Veterans for Peace members do. So join me in welcoming Dud Hendrick. Thank you, Lee. <laughs> Excuse me. Thank you, Lisa. I have an admission to make. <coughs> I don't often declare I'm a Naval Academy graduate. I think that might get the attention of uh, you folks uh, over there in the vest on the opposite side of the street. Naval Academy graduate, not proudly so. Not proudly so. I would say that I was a victim of the glorification of the military and of the war that led me to make the decision to go to the Naval Academy, just as I would say, in all probability, my classmate Billy Fitzgerald was also led to go to the Naval Academy, whose name emblazoned one of the Aegis destroyers that was dedicated here, at which time I also protested. So my journey has led me to believe that uh, the inordinate glorification of war in our society has taken us down a terrible path. I had the great privilege this past summer of spending some time with Chief Oren Lyons. Oren Lyons is an Onondaga faith keeper. I was able to sit with him for four or five hours and interview him about a whole host of issues and our conversation proved to be very relevant to what is happening here today. The now 91-year-old chief spoke of values, values. As you may know, the Onondaga people are one of the six tribes of the Iroquois Nation. Consider that the Iroquois Nation's decision-making process, their governance, is based on the well-being of the seventh generation into the future. 
unquestionably, there would be no more warships built here if such wisdom were governing the planning process of our dominant culture. It can arguably be posed that values of the dominant culture have brought us unfettered militarism and depletion of resources and climate crisis, and in general, a fouling of our planet, Mother Earth, as the Onondaga people speak of it. Chief Lyons also spoke of the global forum of spiritual and parliamentary leaders who convened back in the 80s and 90s. He was one of the 1,000 or so leaders from around the world who participated in their conversations and their deliberations to include the likes of the Dalai Lama and Mother Teresa, Bishop Tutu, and even Gorbachev and our Vice President Al Gore. They had pledged to work against the perils of armaments and for balancing resources and for a fundamentally changed and better world. At the conclusion of their deliberations, Chief Lyons was given a standing ovation after he had read a letter by Chief Seattle delivered to President Franklin Pierce in 1855. And Chief Lyons read from that letter, the white man's hunger for land would eat the earth bare and leave only desert. Continue to soil your bed, and one night you will suffocate in your waist. At the conclusion of their deliberations, the collective wisdom of all those leaders from around the planet was summarized in the four words, value, change for survival. Value, change for survival. Consider the inanity of our military spending. The U.S. annual military budget is approaching 800 million. 800 million. And then think about those demonized countries. China spends less than one-third of that. Russia spends 60 billion. We spend nearly 800 billion. And get this, the boogeyman of them all, North Korea's military budget is less than that of the New York City Police Department. General Dynamics CEO Phoebe Novakovic, her compensation package is in the neighborhood of 19 million. We know that the politicians are in the pockets of General Dynamics, and we know what is expected of them in return. Just as General Dynamics and Lockheed Martin and Raytheon and Boeing and their brethren determine what major media allow us to hear or see. And we know that all this is totally unacceptable and unsupportable. And then there are those 800 U.S. military bases on other lands in other countries, all contributing to the fouling of the planet that those people surrounding those military bases know so well, just as the neighbors of many, many, many military bases in our country are the Superfund sites that demand cleanup. The military and militarism is the single entity that contributes the most to the climate crisis and the assault on Mother Earth. The picture is altogether outrageous. It's sickening. It's so appalling as to defy belief. Bath Ironworks and its ilk will either change willingly or change will ultimately be forced upon it. Those of us who see that day will celebrate. Value change for survival. Value change for survival. Thank you.
Thank you, Dud. I appreciate your spiritual and historical perspective, being a history major. Um, it's always good to hear what, uh, who's gone before us and, and listen to their wisdom and learn from them about our present times. Um, we do have some faith leaders here with us today, and a couple of them are, have agreed to speak. I'm very happy to introduce Mayor Honan, who's an ordained minister of the UCC, United Church of Christ, and she's going to talk to us a little bit about christenings of warships. Thank you. Join me in welcoming Mayor. Hello. Um, I just think we should remember what a christening is about. Huh? It's, a, it's a sacred ritual. It's used as a, a wake-up call, usually. Not for the baby, necessarily, if most times it's a baby. This time it's a weapon of violence. But it's used to remember a spiritual realm. It's used to call people to wake them up that they're responsible to protect this being. It has nothing to do with how it's being used today. There's nothing sacred about what's happening here. There's nothing sacred about the billions of dollars that are put into weaponry in our country. And I tend to be a pragmatist, although I totally believe in the sacred, in you and me and everybody. I might not act it out, but I believe it. One time I was in a situation and um, I was attacked first verbally and then threatened to be beaten. And I couldn't get out of the situation. There was, I was actually literally blocked in. And my prayers, they were of no effect. My good thinking about this person wasn't working. My communication skills didn't help a bit. And I think maybe as activists, sometimes we forget evil and we forget what the hell do we do about it in this world. How many of us would truly stand up to evil and have nonviolence in our hearts at that moment? I, I have no idea. I turned to panic. That's what happened in my mind and heart. And in my panic, what I wanted was uh, the security guard that I knew was on the same floor. How to get him, how to get his help. So I understand the need for protection, uh, mainly in general, but also from that experience. I understand that this uh, rationale that we build these things to protect, but anybody, anybody who reads a little bit and sits with the course of war and the course of destruction knows this isn't the way. We know it. We don't know what to do about it frequently. I, I believe that. But we know it. So I just pray. Yes, I do pray. May we wake up and realize the light within us and stop in any way we can because all of our ways are different, are unique in any way we can to lean into the light and love. This is not the way. What's happening here today is a sacrilege. Powerful words, thank you, Mayor. Uh, next up, we're gonna hear from another person who has walked the walk and talked the talk for many years. Um, this is Bill Bliss, uh, who lives in Bath, and I'll let him introduce himself further. Thanks, Bill. Thanks, Lisa. Hey, folks. My name is Bill Bliss, and I'm a local pastor. I've been uh, part of a community called the Neighborhood United Church of Christ here in Bath. We've been teaching, preaching, and witnessing to the possibility of peace uh, 
for a long, long time, this is a congregation that adopted a just peace covenant 35 years ago in the shadow of this shipyard and the Naval Air Station. And um, what Lisa asked me to speak just a few minutes ago, and I said no. Then I said yes. And then she said, well, you'll be right after Mayor. And I said, oh, well, Mayor's going to say everything <laughs> I'm going to say. But I'll just uh, amplify that a little bit. I think it's lovely that we have two uh, UCC ordained folks here. And, and I want to just speak to that. I want to speak to the, the word that is at the center of this, christening. People often say, well, why would we... Uh, why would a, a person of Christian faith want to have a warship christened? And, and my response to that is, of course we want it christened. To me, this uh, Christ is our humanness. It is the, uh, the love that's at the foundation of the universe revealing itself in our humanness. I want that humanness to go out to sea. I want that humanness to be on board the uh, USS Carl Levin. I trust the depth of the power of that humanness because in the depth of humanness is love and kindness and a heart for healing. So we call our community the neighborhood because we are uh, there and we consider everyone in the whole world to be a neighbor and a cousin. And, and what is a neighbor but someone who is somehow other than us? And what did our teacher say? Love your neighbor. Reach out to those who are other. So I'm just here to witness to the, the oneness of every single person who can hear my voice, every person who uh, can witness the christening of a battleship. And to say with that christening, we speak the words of the, the teacher and the master. My burden is light. My yoke is easy because what I bear is love and kindness and healing for all. So when we christen the ship, we say, go with peace. Ironic and paradoxical, that's life. Let's live it, let's be aware, and let's heal. Thanks. Yay. Thank you, Bill. Wow, he's so tall, much taller than I am. Um, Love to hear people's perspective on why they return again and again here to Bath Iron Works to bring their truth and their words to the situation. Um, next up, we're going to hear from someone who's been here many, many times. Uh, Mary Beth Sullivan is a resident of Bath. Uh, she's a social work supervisor at an organization I won't name because they're not affiliated with this action, but you all know what I mean. And MB is going to talk to, she's the person that taught me about conversion. She, MB is the first person that told me about Seymour Melman and his theories back in the 1950s about how the military industrial complex could still uh, provide um, good jobs and the things that we need and convert from building weapons. So I don't think that's what MB is going to talk about today, though. I think she's going to share some thoughts on death. So welcome Mary Beth Sullivan. Thanks Lisa. Yeah, I want to I want to riff a little bit on death. Um, I want to confess it's I've been off baseline as they say in the field of social work. I'm generally an optimistic happy person who can see the gift of life all around me. And this has been one hell of a year, as we all know. COVID has been pretty devastating um, to be, uh, yeah, to be working from home, to not be connected, to be afraid of each other, to have to um, avoid contact, avoid connection while we watch the numbers of people who are dying from COVID grow on a day-to-day -day basis. That wears on the psyche. To live in this constant state of fear, fear of mask, uh, people who don't wear masks, people uh, who don't vaccinate, people who don't cooperate, people who don't understand. There's one truth. There's good guys and bad guys. The bad guys don't think, aren't clear, are stupid, are not whatever. So 
when the fear is stimulated on a day-to-day -day basis, that is overwhelming. And it's taking away my happy nature. But I also, I mean, I think it's important to think about death. Death is like all around us. And I just want to share some of my own experiences with death in recent weeks. Well, number one, we all woke up to the headlines of the US Pentagon apologizing for the drone strike that happened in Afghanistan that killed innocent people. I want to hold in my heart those innocent people who died in such a horrific way. I also want to hold in my heart all those people in Afghanistan, all those innocents who died unrecognized and unapologized. Frankly, the people standing in this line have been holding in our hearts the angst of the people who've been killed by U.S. drones over the last how many years? Day in and day out without apology. All the weddings, all the funerals, all the bombings that took place on innocent people, and we never recognized it. Do you remember when we started bombing in Iraq and someone asked our leaders in Washington, how many innocent Iraqis were killed in this bombing? And the answer was, that is not a number that interests us. That leader was not speaking for me. That was a lie. That number interests me greatly. And it still does. And holding that pain has not gone away. And these months of isolation and fear-mongering has brought that pain into reality, into my heart, and it feels someday like my heart wants to burst. In the last month, I have helped support social workers who are navigating, working with people experiencing homelessness during a pandemic in the richest country of the world. And we finally, finally made time to mourn the loss of 12 people whom we knew and loved who died this year, but because we couldn't come together to honor their passing, we did it all at once, or did it in bits. Twelve people who lived with the trauma of ex the experience of homelessness in the richest country in the world. And these are not anonymous people. These are people we knew and we loved, we celebrated with, we danced with, we shared meals with, we shared, we shared life with and their lives were taken too quickly. And their lives were taken too quickly because they experienced homelessness in the richest country of the world. <laughs> Maybe my goal is to make you all as depressed as I have been, <laughs> and I'm so sorry for that. But the reason I wanted to come and speak is to amplify what Bruce has said about Peter, oh, Peter Woodruff died too young and died too recently from us. The, myst the mystery of death is what is striking to me. What happens when we die? Whether it's violently or holding the hand of someone you love, I don't know. It is a great mystery. But here's what I hold on to. I pray to the soul of Peter Woodruff. Peter, you guided us in life to hold a vision of what our neighbors could be building that would contribute to a new way of being on the planet. And that vision inspired every single one of us. So I beg you, Peter, to gather up the souls we've lost and to shine the light that gives us the strength to keep moving forward toward the vision of love and light and conversion that we know that we know is where 
survival and love and lives. The only way we're going to survive the 21st century is by giving up the notion that China is our enemy or our competitor and understand that until we cooperate with China and Russia and every other living soul in this world to navigate how we change to survive climate crisis, we're all doomed. Peter, we pray, show us the way. Give me a minuscule ounce of your courage to keep moving forward in the midst of this chaos. Amen. Powerful words from Mary Beth Sullivan. I promised that I would talk a little bit about how the consent for these uh, weapons programs gets manufactured. I'll just talk about this uh, location right here in Bath, Maine. You know, Maine doesn't have a big war machine. Um, and Maine is a relatively small state. Bath Iron Works, now owned by General Dynamics, is one of the biggest, if not the biggest, private sector employers in the state. So it has a lot of support from people who've, you know, uh, raised families and made a living uh, by working here. How is it that we can't have universal health care and we can't have universal housing, yet we can give, you know, allocate $800 billion a year to the Pentagon budget and be building hugely expensive uh, weapon systems that you know, basically benefit a, a very, very wealthy corporation such as General Dynamics. They are so wealthy that they buy back their own stock. Um, they, this is a, basically a corporate welfare scheme where, you know, you, the taxpayer, get to pay 30% and uh, out of your um, income each year, and then your elected representatives, so-called representatives and senators, make sure that that money flows right into the coffers of very, very, very wealthy people. Well, I met with Shelley Pingree, Congresswoman Shelley Pingree. She represents the first district, which we're in right now. I live in Solon, so I'm represented by uh, Jared Golden. But I met with Shelley Pingree right after she had gone to Washington the fir for the first her first term in office, and she was holding a, you know, meet and greet. Um, and I uh, said to her, "When are we going to hear from you that you, you know, you?" used to go around telling people about the academic research that economists have shown far more good union jobs would be generated by investing in anything other than weapon systems, pretty much, anything they've studied. And, you know, when are you going to do that work now that you're in Congress? And she said, well, I can't, Lisa, because they came to me and said, do you want to throw 3,000 people out of work your first term in office? And I was confused by that statement. At the time, I was probably more naive than I am now um, because I thought, but you're the one that told me you don't have to explain the research to me. I used to travel around explaining that research to people when I worked for Common Cause. Well, I think, though, what she was giving us was a window into how our elected representatives are corralled and controlled quickly once they have uh, gotten to a position where they could really make a difference. Um, Governor Janet Mills, a Democrat, is inside today speaking to the um, Levin family and the assembled guests for the launch of this warship. Um, she has a D after her name. Uh, Angus King, Senator Angus King, he's an independent, but he's always inside kissing the ring of General Dynamics at a warship christening. Um, Susan Collins, a Republican. Now, I know the Senate is in session today so in, in Washington, so I know that all of the both senators planned on being here. Whether they are actually here or whether they're down in Washington, I don't know that for a fact. But Senator Susan Collins, a Republican, is always here at these warship christenings. Again, sometimes she speaks. Um, Jared Golden, my representative, served in the military in Iraq and Afghanistan, knows what combat looks like. He, too, votes for $800 billion again for another year for the Pentagon budget, even though in his district, you know, last time around the first uh, time he served, his first term, he co-sponsored the Medicare for All bill because I just retired from teaching in the second district. There are a lot 
of people without health care in the second district. And if you think that doesn't affect their children's education, even if the children have main care, if their primary caregivers don't have health care or dental care, um, it affects their quality of life and their ability to you know, learn and do what they need to do. And we're in a pandemic and we still don't have universal health care. And Jared Golden has now been captured by the whole you know, congressional um, mindset that this is the only thing we can do with our treasure and this is the only jobs program we can have. So they get convinced that they're not going to get reelected if they don't toe the line. And that may be true. It may be true that they wouldn't get elected if they didn't toe the line. I just keep wishing one of them would have the fucking courage to try it and see Yay. if they represent what the majority of people in their district want maybe they still could get reelected. But of course, I'm overlooking the whole corporate information control part of this equation. The same corporations that control Congress control the media in this country. And so they uh, manufacture consent for programs that people, if asked in a poll, do you want universal health care or do you want another warship, they'll say, we want universal health care. We don't want the Unaffordable Care Act. We can't afford health care under the Unaffordable Care Act. But what the you know National Public Radio, which is anything but public, totally corporate sponsored, you know every paper, every big da city daily in Maine is owned by the same company, with the exception of the Bangor Daily News. So Portland Press Herald, Times Record, Kennebec Journal, Waterville. Morning Sentinel, all owned by the same company and controlled as to what, do you see any reporters out here with us today? Reporters have told us in the past that they've been told by Bath Ironworks management, if you cover the protests outside the gate, you will not get access to the program that's going on inside. And that access piece is how they control journalists because it's kind of like saying not, you're not gonna get reelected. They say to them, if you give any uh, amplification or space to the people that are protesting the programs that we support, you're not going to get access. You're not going to get to interview Senator Susan Collins or Senator Angus King and so forth. So it really doesn't matter whether they have an R after their name, a D or an I, they're all here supporting General Dynamics making billions of dollars off U.S. taxpayers while little children go to bed hungry. And that's what I'm angry about. And that's what I, you know, uh, I'm with MB, you know, I, I'm usually a pretty optimistic person. My dad always said, don't get mad, get even. So I do get angry and I, and I you know, hold space for the anger and the indignation that I feel about the path of this country. But then I get busy and I'm a communications person and I, you know, I blog about it. I uh, try to work with journalists that will work with us about it. Uh, make videos, invite speakers, you know, paint banners. This is the communications work that we can do. And, you know, believe me, um, when we, our la the last time we protested was at the climate crime scene of the Blue Angels Air Show, which puts so much greenhouse gas emissions into the air. It's amazing and just burning up fuel for entertainment. It's a recruiting event to get people to be in awe of the military. But, you know, the last time that we went there and, uh, and did that, after the program was over, um, my husband and I were in downtown Brunswick and he was wearing his main Natural Guard t-shirt, as I'm wearing now, and a woman sitting outside the coffee shop where we were about to get coffee said, oh, I like your t-shirt. And he said, thank you. And she said, did you know there's a big protest at the air base today about the Blue <laughs> Angels? And he said, well, yes, I did know that. And she said, my mother is down there. She has never gone to a protest before, but she made a big yellow sign that said, uh, pollution isn't patri polluting isn't patriotic. And so she's down there at the gates. And I believe she had her granddaughter with her too. There was a, a young woman with unicorn hair. That's what they call the many colorful uh, colored hair. And um, the, they seem to be together. I did see the yellow sign. It was a great sign. So, you know, part of what we need to realize about this manufactured consent is there is a lot more agreement with our point of view about how our tax dollars are spent 
and what programs are supported and what information gets out there than we would think by reading the paper and watching uh, the corporate news. There's a lot, there are a lot more of your neighbors who agree with you, on, not on everything, but on many of these points than you may think and may realize. So that keeps me optimistic. It's uh, motivating to me to keep going. And, you know, really, we go down to the air shows because the cars just inch by, thousands of people just inching by in cars. I'm a retired school teacher. My target audience is that nine-year-old, 10-year-old kid in the back seat that as they go by, their mouth is opening and they're about to go, Mom, what are those people doing? You know, does mom explain it to him or does she say never mind or just ignore the question? It doesn't matter. The question got asked and that's why we're out here as people drive by to let them know we don't all agree with this as a jobs program and we don't all agree that this is the path to security. There is not agreement on that point no matter what the corporate press and your congressional delegation and your governor want you to think. So I appreciate everyone being here and listening to me rant on about this. Um, that was the end of our scheduled speakers for today, but um, I would like to open up the microphone to anyone who has a few words that they'd like to say. Okay, come right up. Hi, my name is Nancy in Rockland. Uh, I just have to, I'm compelled to address this idea of christening, uh, which, I don't think has been adequately addressed. When in the Christian denominations a child is christened, water, holy water has been blessed, is poured over that child um, to cleanse it from original sin. I never quite understood how an infant could have original sin. But in this case, I think christening is very appropriate because this is an original sin if you understand sin to be the lack of innocence, the lack of caring, the lack of moral compass. This christening will not cleanse anything, nobody's hands are going to be clean after this christening. Nobody's spirit, soul, heart, mind, or pocketbooks will be cleansed from this christening. Anyone? Well, I guess that concludes our program for today. I really appreciate everyone coming out and being here. Some people drove a long way to get here, and um, it's always good to get the uh, the folks together and uh, be able to give each other a hug or a elbow bump or whatever we're doing at, at this time to be safe. Um, please call your congressional delegation or send them an email or tweet at them or find whatever way of communication that works best for you and let them know you do not consent. You want more jobs, more good union jobs, but building hospital ships or offshore wind platforms or um, components for homes to be more energy efficient. We need to be building a sustainable program. Building warships and weapons of mass destruction is not sustainable in the 21st century. And all empires find that out sooner or later in a painful way. Um, let's turn the corner and turn ourselves around before we, the US empire goes down in flames. And uh, Dud will say some concluding remarks here. Dud? I just wanted, I just wanted to say a couple words to the five uh, gentlemen over there in uniform. I understand being part of the culture makes it difficult for you to pay attention to what was being said here today. But I would suggest to you that if any of this goes up online, you make every effort to listen to it. There was a hell of a lot of wisdom spoken here today, and it ought to be heard by you guys. I'd sure appreciate it. We all would if you'd take a look and listen to us. Thanks very much. Okay, thanks, everybody. I know it costs us uh, a lot to be here today. I missed two FaceTime calls from my grandchildren in California to do this program. So, you know, 
it was worth it. No pain, no gain. But thanks, everybody, for what it cost you to be here today. It's really, really lovely to see your faces. Thank you, everyone.